Nature Nerd Night. Um, thanks for joining us, everyone. We are going to go ahead and get started. And if you've joined a Nature Nerd Night before, you know how this goes. The last one. Some of our presenters have never joined, so, so you, can, you can see this too. All right. All right. Let's do it. If you're a nature-loving science nerd, we think that you just might be happy like us to start Nebraska Nature Nerd Night. Birds, bees, parasites, snakes, and fossils too. If you're a curious brainiac, we got a show for you. You know, okay. we've done that six times now, and it's still a super nerdy. It's, pretty, it's, awkward. it's still pretty awkward, but it's good. It's okay. good fun. Well, thanks for joining us, everyone. That, Like I said, this is our last Nebraska Nature Nerd Night tonight. And to kind of wrap up everything, we have a huge panel here, five people of some awesome biologists from Nebraska Human Parks. Um, and we're going to be talking tonight about some field flops yeah. and, and some failures. Funny, and failures. Like everyone, but, like we're humans too. Biologists mm -hmm. are humans too. Mm -hmm. We Things don't always go as planned. And um, we're going to hear about some of those stories tonight. The fun, the fun stories of field work. Yes. Yes. Um, so let's go ahead and um, first of all, let's go ahead and introduce ourselves because we always forget to do that. Every time. Uh, so my name is Monica McCubrey. I'm the wildlife education specialist um, here in the Lincoln office. And I'm Amber Schultz. I'm the wildlife education program manager with the Fish and uh, Wildlife Education Division at Game and Parks. Awesome. So we will go ahead and get started. Let's um, introduce our Nature Nerd Night panel tonight. Mm -hmm. um, if you guys want to go ahead quickly, just kind of go around and tell us um, your name and then what you do at Game and Parks, because all of us are actually here from the same organization mm -hmm. tonight, which mm -hmm. is kind of one of a first for us. Yeah. Um, so if Sam, if you'd like to go ahead and start. Sure. My name is Sam Wilson. I'm the fur bearer and carnivore program manager for the Nebraska Game and Parks Commission, the wildlife division in the Lincoln office. And I mostly work with the fur bearers are the little animals with valuable fur like foxes and mink and muskrat. And then the carnivore part of that is working with mountain lions. Um, Ryan, do you wanna go ahead and introduce yourself? Yeah, hello everybody. I'm Ryan Ruskamp. I'm a fisheries biologist at Game of Parks. I work on the Missouri River, uh, primarily with the endangered pallid sturgeon, but we work with pretty much all the fish out there. Um, and I heard turtles, so I'm excited about that. And we do a little bit with turtles once in a while also. Awesome. Scott, you want to go next? Oh, we're on mute. Got it. <laughs> I am. I'm Scott Wessel. I'm a private lands wildlife biologist for the Game and Parks in Norfolk. And since 97% of Nebraska's land is privately owned, there's lots to do with wildlife on private land. So. Awesome. So some interesting stories probably. Yes. In and the field there. I mean, look how relaxed he is. I know. He's like, he's ready this. for this. Yeah. He's not in the field. Yeah, that's true. Yeah. yeah. No, no exactly. failures or flops. So. Yeah. <laughs> All right, Allie, how about you? I'm Allie Mays. I'm the community science specialist. Um, so I work on getting people involved with the research we do at Game and Parks. Great. And last but not least, Sean Dunn. Hi, I'm Sean Dunn. I'm the natural heritage zoologist in uh, the Lincoln office. So I kind of take care of everything else, our herps, insects, and small mammals like bats and rats, moles, things like that. Awesome. Well, thanks everyone for joining us. We are really excited to have all of you in such a variety and perspective tonight too. So Okay, so we're going to get started with our questions. We have lots for you tonight, and we'll see, and we're going to hear some cool stories, maybe some funny stories, and mostly appropriate ones too, right? Yes, we chatted about mostly, that, right? Yeah. But <laughs> we'll see how it goes. But first, what we want to know is, I know that we heard from what your position is currently, but I know just like in any kind of, in this career, many of us have like a bunch of different positions. I know I probably was a temporary position at least 10 different times. You know? Yeah, there's a lot of hats. Right, a lot of hats that we wear in this in this career field. So we wanna know from you, what's your origin story? Um, did you always wanna work in this field at large and what led you down this path? So um, we'd love to hear from each of you on this question. It's a pretty cool one. And if you can answer it, I know that's a lot of pressure, but in like, maybe, I don't know, a few sentences. Yeah, yeah. a couple sentences just about so your what, life. Yeah, your life, yeah, no, no big pressure, yeah. <laughs> What's your origin story? How'd you get in uh, field work in the natural resources career field? Um, who would like to go first? I will. No, oh. Ryan will. Oh. Sean's going. 
Oh. Well, um, I've kind of always wanted to do something in natural resources. So when I was at the University of Nebraska Lincoln uh, doing my undergrad, I actually wanted, I always wanted to work with wildlife, funny enough. But um, I applied for a job, a temporary job, actually doing telemetry with bighorn sheep when that project first got started. And I didn't get that position. And I got a position with the fisheries at UNL and the rest is history. And then I, you yeah. know, that's what I've been doing for 20, for 23 years, I've been working with pallet sturgeon. Wow. So. They're a little different than bighorn sheep, so. Slightly. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> that's awesome. Thank you, Ryan. All right, Sean, you wanted to go so badly. It's up to you next. I did. I was really excited. Um, I do love talking about myself. So, <laughs> um, but yeah, I mean, like Ryan, I think I've always been interested in, in just being outdoors and seeing how things work and those relationships among um, various species in the environment. And, you know, I started volunteering at a, uh, a nonprofit organization that works with uh, birds of prey when I was like 15. And I, at the time I wanted to be a herpetologist and then I wanted to be an ornithologist. And then in my undergrad, I wanted to be a mammologist. And uh, then in my grad career, I worked on uh, beetles, insects a lot. So being a, a, a zoologist has, has worked out really well because I just got enough experience in just about everything. Yeah, is, is a zoologist a position for people who just can't make up their mind or? Yeah, it seems to be. So awesome. I, um, I, I will absolutely tell you that I am a, um, a jack of all trades. I am not uh, a specific uh, ology by any way. So I'm, I don't know it all and I'm happy to call on experts that do when I need the help. I mean, when I have a science question, I ask you, yeah. I'm not going to lie. Mm -hmm. You are my person and, to ask. And then I usually hang up the phone and Google it. And then I call uh -huh. you back. I'm like, oh yeah, it's totally this. That's how science works. That's, That's how, how science works. Just yeah. <laughs> Who's next? Allie, do you want to go? Sure. So I grew up knowing I wanted to work in um, biology or wildlife. I always thought I would do um, research and then after my undergrad I went and got an education internship because I had experience um, working in college at a preschool to pay the bills so it just fit um, and then I realized how important education was but I still wanted to do research and lucky enough I found community science um, got on with a few different citizen science positions around the country and was able to do this perfect career that bridged science and outreach and education. And so I've just been kind of chasing that ever since. And then this position happened. Wow. <laughs> so exciting. So I'm sure you have some awesome stories about both the research and like the, the people aspect as well. Maybe similar to Scott. Very cool. Who's next? Uh, you choose. Scott, you want to go? Sure. Um, like a lot of people, I I was always outside. I loved outdoors. So my biggest influences when I was young uh, were, were my dad. Sam's dad actually was a pretty big influence of mine. Wow. Um, what? 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 He he was my hunter education instructor. Wow, that is awesome. When I was when I was young. Um, I went to high school. I talked to my guidance counselor said, I'd like to be a game warden. And he said, Scott, there's no chance that you'll get a job in the conservation field. You should be a cop. And so I didn't pay attention to that. I decided to be a history major. And I went to college to be a history teacher. After a while, I decided that wasn't what I wanted to do. So after a hiatus from college, I came back got a biology degree, went on, got my master's degree in zoology because I couldn't make up my mind either. Uh, and had an emphasis in fishery science and studied, studied paddlefish in the Missouri River. So, cool. Yep. Man, a lot of diverse backgrounds. I know, that's awesome. Yeah, who knew Scott was gonna be a history teacher? Yeah, and, and he knew Sam's dad. I know, that's awesome. Sam. All right, well. I, kind of a similar story, but 
I, I always enjoyed being outside and, and being in wild places. My parents, my dad was a hunter safety instructor for 50 years and liked to hunt and hike and go canoeing. And my mom and my whole family went and uh, I kind of got interested in bird watching. And at the time, California condors were about to go extinct. So I begged my parents to drive me to California so I could see the condors before they went extinct. And they actually wow. did it. So we drove out there and sat on a mountainside and there were researchers there with telemetry and uh, little notebooks writing down the numbers, of the wings. And this was the same year that Return of the Jedi came out. So it was like long ago and I was very young. Wow. I was watching those biologists on that mountainside in California. I thought, man, I want to do this. I want to, I want to have a job where I get to sit on a mountainside and look at awesome animals like condors. So cool. I chased that dream the whole time and into UNL for my undergrad and then got my master's through the co-op unit at UNL also. And then to various jobs, including this one. So that's my order. That's, that's, it's such an incredible story. And you know what it makes me think of? When we're all out there like doing field work, like we could be, like a, the little junior Sams could be watching. You yeah. never know. Like they that's might true. be staring at us doing all the crazy oh, stuff yeah. we do thinking, I want to get paid to do that someday. So super cool story. Thanks for sharing that, Sam. Um, let, are we going to jump right into field work now? Yeah, I want to hear some stories. Okay, let's, like let's, that's what we're so, here for. So, um, one of our questions we talked about was um, talk to us about field work. Like in my head, I always think of you're always out in the field doing something really cool. Um, you're sitting on a mountainside, you're sitting on a mountainside doing radio telemetry, yeah. where you're putting collars on mountain lions or tracking pellet sturgeon. Is that always what it's like? Is that yeah. always what field work is? Maybe like? like if you can think like think about a day in a field work or like an experience that you've had and share what it what it truly means to say, like, we're going out to the field. Today. And it what might be doing. different for all of you too. Right. Yeah. So if anyone wants to tackle that question. To yeah. Start. And you guys can just fight for it. So go for it. Not all at once. Mm -hmm. Okay. I'll, I'll go Thank for you. It. Uh, well, right now we are, we're doing trial line. We're running trial lines um, to catch the broodstock. Uh, pallet sturgeon to send to the hatchery to try to make other pallet sturgeon. And so right now when we go to the field, you know, like today, we we had lines set already overnight. So we had six trout lines set. Uh, each line had 40 night crawlers on it. Mm -hmm. We had a great day today. We actually shipped three to the hatchery. Wow. Oh, awesome. It was it was a big day for us. But um, then we, re, we reset the lines. We'll go out and pull them again tomorrow. That's just... Uh, and then if we'll catch a fish right now, the, the water's a little cold, but when the water's warmer, we'll actually do surgeries right on the boat, implant transmitters, where we can follow these fish around later with, with the ultrasonic telemetry. Mm. Uh, that's what we do right now. During the summer, we, we do, we trawl for young of the year sturgeon, looking for that needle in the haystack, trying to find some reproduction of pallet sturgeon out there in the Missouri river. Um, it doesn't happen very often. There's only been a handful in the, in, since I've been doing this. So um, that's kind of what we do. You know, any any fish we catch, we we record, weigh, and measure. Any pallets that we catch, if they're wild, we'll send them to the hatchery if they haven't been used for propagation already. Um, if they're not, if they're a hatchery fish, well, then we'll decide whether or not we want to put a transmitter in, like I said, or we will just uh, release that fish. All the pallets get a pit tag which is kind of like the same tag you, uh, you'll put in your dog or cat. Mm. And so if we catch them later and if the fish hasn't had it taken before, we'll take genetics, to see how pure that fish is. If it's a pure palate, if it's a possibility if it's a hybrid or, or something like that. So, Man, that sounds like a lot, a lot of stuff. Um, I heard like yeah. shipping and surgery and like tracking. <laughs> yeah. like There's a lot crawlers. of stuff going on. It's a lot of moving yeah. parts. We're, uh, we've all on this crew. We, I think the, the 15 years is probably the least experience out of the crew wow. right now. And so we, we tackle these moving parts pretty good. So cool. It seems like a lot, but we get through it pretty well. Got a good team. That's awesome to have. Yeah. yeah. Very cool. Thanks, Ryan. Yep. Anyone else want to talk about their field work? I I'll can. go. Okay. You want to rock, paper, scissors at Sean? Oh my God, this is fantastic. All right, Allie Wong. Allie. 
Um, so for me, fieldwork has been pretty variable over the years. I My background um, has a lot of bird research in it. So that would be like going out and setting up nets and catching birds in the nets, taking them out of the nets and then um, banding them. So anything from like songbirds to owls um, and that community science part. So um, quite a few of my jobs involved like color banding birds in people's backyards. So you're like setting up the nets in urban areas and then you talk to them about um, the birds you catch and they watch you do the process. And there was also like, we took blood samples and feather samples um, from those birds and recorded all sorts of measurements. Um, but field work that I've helped with has involved anything from insects to urban wildlife. And um, yeah, so it's not just one type, it's, a, it's been a lot of different types. And especially with my job now, um, there's quite a few things that we're dabbling in um, and it can often involve taking people out in the field with you to help them mm -hmm. learn how to do it. Um, so yeah, I guess I'll let Sean talk now. No, that's great. Thanks, Allie. Thanks, Allie. I was just gonna give up. So I'm, I'm glad you called me out on it, but um, <laughs> no, I think, you know, one thing that, um, again, I work with a lot of different taxes, so it, it, it varies a lot of what I do. Um, I work a lot with insects and catching insects involves everything from walking in a field with a net to setting spe very specific traps for the type of beetle or butterfly that you're looking for. Um, and so it, it varies a lot, but what I will say is, um, Field work is awesome when it works out. It, it is like what Sam talked about, you know, sitting on the side of a mountain or whatever it may be that you're doing, writing notes in your field journal. Um, it's a lot of fun. It's, you know, allows you to take a look at the landscape and again, how those species are interacting with the landscape. But there's a whole lot that goes on behind the scenes, mm. the, the preparation, the getting the equipment to put on the animal, learning how to do it effectively, safely, so that you don't endanger yourself or the animal. Um, and then once you collect those data, it's really important to do something with those data. Mm -hmm. And otherwise we don't learn from what we do in science. And so, um, yeah, it is when, when things are going well and it's all working out, the field work is really fun, but there's a lot of prep to it and there's a lot of work afterwards to make sure that the work you did is put to good use. That's a really good point. Yeah. And maybe often, you know, people might see biologists and think we're out in the field every single day, just walking around. Right. Yeah. <laughs> Standing out in the field. Yeah. Right. But um, that's a really good point, Sean. And, and I wonder if you could comment or any of you could comment on, I guess it depends on where you are in your career and what type of taxa you're working with, but like What's the percentage of your your uh, career or your time as the biologist, fisheries biologist, whatever it may be, that's actually out in the field versus your we are? I gotta I gotta tell yeah. the secret. We're behind the desk often as what is just as much. So what would you say um, that might be percentage of field versus like actually like you said analyzing that data or doing the logistics or preparing our, all that stuff in an office? You know, I would say. Over the year, I'd say probably 20% of my time is in the field. Mm. Um, and the rest of that is, is preparing to be out in the field or talking mm. with folks or putting those data together um, to be used in some specific way or coordinating with mm -hmm. other people that are collecting data. You know, I, uh, all of us coordinate with other biologists. Um, and that coordination is absolutely critical to what we do. Cause mm -hmm. I certainly don't want to go out in the field and do something that someone's either already doing or they have a better way of doing it. Um, and so that communication is, is really key. And so that's why we spend a lot of the time uh, behind the desk doing email and, and talking to folks. So it makes the science we do that much better and more productive. That's good. Yeah, that's a really good point. That collaboration is key just as much. Sam or Scott, would you have anything to add to that or also tell a bit about like some field work that you've been involved in? I guess I saw uh, Sam unmuted. He's ready. Yeah, I'm ready. Um, kind of echo what Sean said in that 
you know, sometimes I'll say things at a presentation like we captured a coup. And then, I, and then I'll think to myself, like how much preparation went into that very moment. And it's mm. an awesome time to be in the field and, and do something like capturing the lion and a trap and collaring it and getting to handle a magnificent animal like that. But there's everything from writing grants to finding the right uh, techniques and equipment and all that stuff. But um, the other thing I wanna mention about time in the field is that early on in, in your career, you're often in a temporary job where you may be in the field a lot. I hired uh, temporary technicians or biologists to do a lot of the field work. And then as you, as you rise up in the ranks, it seems that you're behind the computer more and more because you have experience and you, you can tell someone how to go out and collect data uh, but you also need to coordinate how the whole project will work. And so, mm -hmm. uh, you know, I guess that shifts as, as you get older and, and advance in your career. But we, I've gotten to do all kinds of fun things from, um, you know, right out of college, I was working a, a job where I helped eradicate feral hogs on Catalina Island and got to fly around in helicopters and night, cool. night vision and pound. <laughs> and I came to Nebraska and John and hired me for the non-game bird position and I got to hold a shield up on top of the Capitol building and defend him from a peregrine falcon while he was trying oh out. My God. <laughs> so yeah this is like know. a lot of Jedi like echoing <laughs> Sam that's like following you through your career. Yep yep so uh done all kinds of things and then uh trapped river otters for my master's project and they're fierce in the traps and really a cool little animal and they're doing really well if people haven't heard they've been delisted and we have a small season on them this year. And then on to the mountain lion research that we're doing now where I can see a, a female mountain lion shrinking down her home range and going back to the same den night after night. Mm. And then uh, 28 or 30 days later, we'll go in and, and tag the kittens that are in that natal. So, uh, all, all kinds of opportunities, but I, like Sean said, maybe, maybe even less than 20% of my time is spent out in the field. But when I, you know, I have great memories of going out there and I do get to get out every year. That's good. That's very cool. Okay, so being in the field means something completely different to me. Let's uh, hear it. I am the introvert in the bunch, and I'm in a people job. I have <laughs> to work with people all the time. And, and it takes a lot of energy to do that, because mm -hmm. I just as soon be out catching wildlife, walking through a prairie, doing whatever. But most of what I do involves people. In fact, everything that I do involves people. Everything that all of us do involves people. Mm -hmm. and, and so I think I'm in the field all the time, even when I'm sitting at the, the desk in the office. Um, it's a good so perspective, yeah. I get, at our district offices, we get dozens of calls a day that range from the mundane to the bizarre. And you know, we call them our weird wildlife calls. And, you know, people call with a question. They call with an observation. They call with a problem animal. And they call us and they're interested in wildlife. We respond and we run into lots and lots of interesting people and cool wildlife things as a result. You know, I, I'm blessed to be able to do other things, help with research um both fisheries and wildlife related stuff and and then hopefully make some improvements to habitat for things too so it's a pretty cool gig it's a good solid awesome. perspective yeah, yeah all those things yeah so it sounds like you guys spend you know 20 percent of your time maybe less than 20 percent of your time so i'm sure that you have some good field stories so just like us i can tell you about five dozen times that something didn't go as planned mm -hmm. um I'm sure you have lots, stories as well. Lots of them. Yep. Um, so we want to hear from you. What is a time that um, something didn't quite go as planned or um, kind of what happened in the field? Um, what did you do? What happened? Um, did you change something because of that happening now? Or do you, you just don't do have anymore? You just have a good laugh yes. and move on with your lives. What, what sure was the result of that? Yeah, Scott raised his hand. So I think he has a good story there. Okay, so this just happened a couple of weeks ago. Oh um, my gosh. I was... I was talking to somebody on my cell phone on a gravel road and the herd manager for the bison herd with the Ponca tribe in Nebraska pulled up, looked frantic. He said, Scott, do you have a wire cutter? And I'm like, well, no, I've got a 
uh, nippers for cedar trees. He says, come with me. And, <laughs> and we drove our trucks as fast as we could. We pull up to the bison pasture and there is a bull bison with his horn caught in the electric fence. And it's a high voltage electric fence. And this animal is very upset that he's entangled in this fence. And Larry, my friend Larry says, we've got to get him out of there. And I'm like, we? I'm the <laughs> manager. And he says, you have the cutters. And, <laughs> and so I grabbed my nippers and I walked up and they're, they're fiberglass handles. I thought, it's fine. It's fine. Oh, no. But it was raining. Oh, and my God. I, the metal part of those nippers hit that electric fence. It spun me around twice. And, and one <laughs> first time I went around, I looked at my left arm and I couldn't see it. And I thought it had blown my left arm off. But then <laughs> when I stopped spinning. It came back and I could see I had my left arm. And I had snot that went out <laughs> nostrils and all the way down to my waist. And I looked at Larry. And he said, wow, that must have been the hot one. And I, yeah, it, it was hot. And he says, we got to get him out of there. I'm like, we? <laughs> I went back. I got gloves. I clipped the wire. And the wire unraveled. And the bison ran away. And everything worked out good. Did he even stop to thank you or just not oh, running? Oh, yeah, we, it? we, uh, I mean, the bison. <laughs> no, the bison did not stop to thank you. Oh, jeez. We, we typically were standing. I've, I've spent time there before. So mm -hmm. I'm just thankful. But, I'm just picturing that scene from Jurassic Park, like when the thing, the kid, like, right? I'm like, picturing oh, yeah. Scott on the, <laughs> oh, man, that's a heck of a story, Scott. Thanks for starting us off with that one. And I'm sorry that that happened to you. But, but I thank you for letting us appreciate laugh. the sacrifice. That was, that was a great for, for my, you probably did my that eyes, just this program tonight. My eyes uncrossed in 24 hours. <laughs> oh my god. Wow, that's that's something. Okay, who has a good story to top that? Or just another good story. <laughs> or just another good story. Yeah. All right, I'll I'll take a shot. It's not going to be anywhere near that, but um, I was on a project <laughs> that we were working to look at um, diet and energetics of bats. And so we were going into these areas, uh, maternity roosts of bats, and we were counting how many were in there. And then we were, uh, the original plan was we had laid out these tarps and we were going to collect the guano and bat poop and we are going to weigh that and then look at what they're eating so you dissect bat guano and you can find insect parts in there and you can kind of get an idea like what groups they're in whether they're moths or beetles or um, hemiptera the true bugs things like that and get an idea of how much energy they're they're burning during that so cool. we go into these caves um and we, we laid out these tarps and we measured how many bats were there. We took pictures, counted all this stuff. Okay, and we left quietly. And uh, we go back in a couple of days later and the idea was, okay, we'll scoop everything up, take it out. And, you know, we had these little scales with us and we can weigh it and all that. Well, um, we, we really underestimated the amount of guano that bats produce. Um, so, and we were, we were in a fairly isolated area. The nearest town where we were staying had a population of maybe, you know, like 800 people or something. Um, Sean, is this in Nebraska? We, Sorry, I missed that. Oh, it was, um, no, it was in Southern Kansas. Okay, cool. Uh, in the Red Hills area. And so they have cool. these beautiful uh, caves down there, gypsum caves mm. um, that are, are full of guano. fascinating areas. What's that? I said full of guano. Full of guano. So we get in there and our tarp is just like mounded full of guano and it's this massive amount. And we're like, what do we do? Okay. And, and I wasn't the PI on this, uh, the um, primary investigator, but I was like, 
okay, we can, we can sort this out, we'll do this. So we drag these tarps full of bat poop out of the cave <laughs> and then we couldn't weigh them because all we had were these little scales. So we had to go to town to the Dollar Tree and we bought like just your standard scale that you stand on in your house. And then out of the back of the truck, we had stored the guano so that we can measure it because you need it for science. So we pulled those out of the trucks in the middle of the street and we're standing there on the scale, like holding these big tarps full of bat poop. And it just reeks. I don't know if you guys have ever smelled bat poop, but they pee in it at the same time. And so it's like this wonderful mixture. And oh my gosh, wonderful. it was so gross. So we had like 86 pounds of guano in one and then another one we had like 60 some pounds of guano and did you have was, a crowd was, watching you or were they running away or no they they it was um it was there like a, a little town. was there like a little sam a wilson we kind of watching thinking i want to do that someday <laughs> <laughs> Next it <year>. was <laughs> it was an experience for sure but we ended up <laughs> modifying things where we were only using a one foot by one foot this is another thing. When you're in the field, you adapt quickly mm. to what's mm -hmm. going on. And we ended up, so there's something researchers use a lot to mark areas um, called flags, flagging wire. And they're like pieces of wire with little tape flags on the end. What we did was we made um, one foot by one foot baskets out of those and put little Dollar Tree trash bags in them. And that gave us a measurable Jeez. amount of guano to collect. And so you so modified food. the project to then collect a appropriate amount of guano to dissect. So that's the best is like imagining Sean like holding <laughs> this like pile of poop in, in the middle in, of Kansas. In the middle of Kansas, like standing on a scale. It know. was so gross. So <laughs> gross. Mm, that's amazing. Thank you for sharing that. Yeah. Bi biologists are superheroes man look they at that. are look at that not all freeing bison weighing, yeah. weighing guano um do you want to ask this next question unless anyone has another yeah does anyone else have a something didn't go right story if not we still we have lots of we have lots of good questions okay what's the funniest thing okay so i'm sure so so often things don't go right in our field work but also sometimes sometimes just really funny things happen um, I can think of like a few instances, even in, in my experience out in the field, um, just hilarious. Maybe that's kind of part of not going right, but also. Yeah, but just, just like good stuff to you laugh just laugh about. later about like mm -hmm. getting shocked when you're trying to. I hope bison. so. Maybe and he's not there yet. He might. Yeah, maybe too soon. Too soon. Too yep. soon. Anyways, um, who would like to share something like one, something like the funniest thing that you remember happening to you during field work? It could even be. Absurd, I mean, not funny. since we're already talking about. I feel like I can just go ahead with this. Okay. Um, when I first started, it was my first season doing bird work. Um, so bird banding. And I was on the prairies in Missouri. And um, Missouri prairies have a lot of blackberry thickets. And so we had a net near the thickets because birds would come in and out of there. And um, it was like my christening into bird banding where I go to the net, there's like a gray cat bird like here in the net, a little above my head. So I'm trying to untangle it and it just like poops right on my face. And <laughs> it's like blackberry poop. So it's like red it's substantial. painting poop that was just there <laughs> all day. Um, Wait, did anyone witness this? Yeah, yeah. I mean- Oh good, know. perfect. That's good. <laughs> oh, that was fun. But I did yeah. learn and, and adjust my methods to <laughs> okay. keep the butt away from me. That's science. There, there you go. go. Keep the butt away. That's, that yep. sounds like a pretty standard rule. <laughs> yeah. You know, oh, when you're, you when you're banding birds, Allie, and you get pooped on, that's good luck. That's what I people mean, say. Is it? <laughs> <laughs> um, Sam or Ryan? Any good, funny field stories? Well, this doesn't involve poop, unfortunately, but uh, oh, well, we were on a roll, but it's okay. Go ahead. <laughs> so we were up at uh, the tail waters of Gavin's Point Dam, um, netting paddlefish and putting jaw tags in. This is a long, long time ago. And um, we have fairly large boats. They're about 22, 20, 22 to 24 feet long, 10 feet wide, aluminum boats, big John boats. And the, the biologist that was driving that day 
we were staying overnight that night and when he pulled the keys out he didn't realize that he disconnected the kill switch so the boat was sitting there and it was we was trying to start trying to start it could get it started well we were already in the water and the other kid actually unhooked the winch rope and the safety chain and we just kind of just forgot about that he did that we couldn't get it started so the guy that was with me said well just pull us up out of up to the parking lot because the other boat had went and they were netting already and said let's just go get their attention and so i start pulling up the ramp and he waves at me to go to the other end of the parking lot and i stepped on a little bit and all i can see is the bottom of this huge boat as it's flying off the trailer onto the ramp oh my god so there's this huge aluminum john boat sitting on the top of the ramp at, at Gavin's Point Dam. So we're like, well, how are we going to get this back on the trailer? There was just two of us. Everybody else had left. Well, we we're going to get a jack out and a tow strap and everything else, trying to figure it out. Well, finally, all the other guys came back. There was eight of us on the crew that day, and eight of us, four on the front and four on the back, we were able to use uh, – we backed the trailer underneath the boat and used the winch strap. Four people hung on the front, and four people lifted the back. We were able to put that trailer – our boat back on the trailer. It's pretty crazy. Wow. Ryan, Ryan I spent a summer uh, working at Harlan Reservoir as the aquatic invasive species technician. And I want you to know that fortunately or unfortunately, you're not in a small, um, you're not in a small group. I, I think I saw at least seven or eight boats go flying off trailers that summer. <laughs> that And the sound of when the boat hit, the, it was like, at, I will never um, unhear that. So yeah. unfortunately that happens. I don't know how, but it's really interesting. Well, it does, even to someone who's supposed to know what they're doing, apparently. Exactly. Right, right. Um, so earlier, uh, Sam, you kind of mentioned that you've had a lot of, not odd jobs, but you've had a lot of different types of jobs. Uh, one of the questions that we had is, what's kind of the, the oddest job or, or job duty that you've had to do? Um, Sean's told me before that he has had to, you know, it's not just field work, it's maybe a mowing a lawn or air, like moving a tractor or that kind of stuff. So What's something odd that you've had to do, a job or a duty um, that you can think of? So when I was hired at Game and Parks and became the, the program manager for Flow Bearers, I didn't really know what all my job entailed. The other program managers were sick of dealing with the walk-in freezer. So they asked me. So, okay, I just nod my head. I was like one month on the job. Okay, I'll deal with the walk-in freezer. So. I didn't know what the walk-in freezer was, which I did learn. So for those of you who don't know, at Game and Parks, we have a freezer where we put samples. So it can be everything from an armadillo that's road killed and picked up to a, a deer that was, you know, confiscated by law enforcement to, you know, a, an albino um, opossum that we want to have mounted and used somewhere. So just filled with kind of random animals and samples. Well, unfortunately, the freezer unit was quite old. And one day when I walked into Game and Parks, people started asking me, what's that smell? Oh my God. <laughs> and then this went on for like two or three days. And finally I walked by the freezer and I noticed a black goo coming out of the door oh, in front of the freezer door. And so I was tasked with opening that up and putting on my <laughs> protective gear and crawling into the freezer and hauling out half melted animals that had died and all kinds of crazy things that had gone in there over the years but you know people were tired and so there was like a giant bow constrictor and uh, somebody's pet cat I think oh my <laughs> gosh okay. animals that had decomposed and in the end we ended up squeegeeing out uh, a disgusting black goo and then finally totally removed the freezer and bought a new one <laughs> I guess that's what it took. This sounds I, like the worst potpourri yeah. I've ever. <laughs> I was on the the group that like helped you clean that out. It was like yes, I think I was here, yeah, three months into the job, and I was like, yeah, I'll do anything. I want to. I want to help. Oh, and man, they took advantage. Yeah, of that. there was like egg rolls in there. Like someone had put <laughs> egg rolls in like this huge five gallon bucket filled it with rice and like stuck egg rolls in there. And there was like like hog urine in a pickle jar. And <laughs> oh yeah, it was. Disgusting. My, I, see, Monica, I, I feel bad because I, I fell into that job because I was new on the job and not didn't have <laughs> wisdom to say no to this. And then I mm. thought, well, help me. And Monica was new on the job. And so I asked you. <laughs> I was so young and naive. I didn't know what I was doing. Thanks oh for the help. That was a terrible, no problem. Terrible it's a good day. story. 
<laughs> wow. That's, that's something. That was good. Um, anyone else have any odd jobs or odd things that they've had to do on the job? Have you ever said that sentence before? It was like, I can't believe I'm actually getting paid to do this. <laughs> like, I feel like I have, but not like a times. cool, like, I yeah, there's the been some cool looking condors, but, but also like, yeah, I can get paid to do mm-hmm. this right now. What do we got, okay. Scott? Okay. So remember, I work with people, right? Mm-hmm. I went to meet a, a guy to look at his, his prairie and we we're going to do a prescribed burn on it. Mm-hmm at his brother's place he was going to meet me at his brother's farmhouse and i got there a little bit early and there was a pickup sitting in front of the house with put up and his brother came to the door and i introduced myself and said i was going to meet his brother and since i was early i asked if he needed a hand with anything his pickup the hood was up and he goes hmm yeah come inside I'm like, oh, no no and <laughs> and he goes i just had knee surgery and so i i can't bend very well and my bathtub is plugged up and would you please help me unplug my bathtub and i'm like <laughs> well i did offer you did i went into the bathtub and it was it may have drained the wildlife freezer, I think. Oh, no. Really odd color to it. And <laughs> he says, I'll get the shop back. And I'm like, okay. And so I get the shop back and it just boom, 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 and big gobs of I don't know what came out. Oh. The bathtub drained and I rinsed it out and I got to my feet, weak need and and sweating profusely, but I walked outside and I've uh, I've tried not to be as helpful since then. <laughs> you learned from that. <laughs> That's oh, all man. other duties as a sign, right? When you get hired, I That's just wonder if you. I just wonder if you updated your resume after that to to t- uh, a little plumbing on Plumber, the side. Yeah, yep. that's that's something. Uh, can, any other I, odd I job duties? Be a plumber. Okay. <laughs> Uh, I've, I've got one that is kind of the opposite of, of gross, I guess. So for a while, I worked at a, a veterinary clinic, and I kind of was a technician, did whatever else. I cleaned the floors on the weekend, just whatever odd jobs they needed to have done and, and helped out. And so um, we were doing, we always did surgeries in the morning. That was the first thing we get there. People drop their cats and dogs off. We do the surgery and then they pick them up in the afternoon. So it's like seven o'clock and we're just getting going. And we realized that uh, we have no sterile lubricant for surgery. So with cats and dogs, you shave an area and then you kind of, grease back the fur and everything so you don't have to shave extra and anything so uh we needed to go out and we didn't have time obviously to order it like they normally do so they gave me like you know 50 bucks and they said go to, down the street to walmart and buy as much ky jelly as you can like the big tubes don't get the little tubes you got to get the big ones and i was like oh okay so it's like 7.15 in the morning and I've got like $50 to buy as many tubes, giant tubes, a KY personal lubricant as you can. Man the with morning. the plan. Right so I don't remember what it was. I think I got like six of them or something. So did you anyway, get weird looks or questions? Yeah, they did. And that's, that's what the vet told me as I was going out the door. They were like, they're going to look at you funny. And I was like, it, it is what it is. It's part of the job, I guess. So. Yep. So Cation. buying KY jelly at like seven fifteen in the morning. <laughs> Fifty bucks worth. Fifty dollars. Fifty worth. bucks worth. Yeah. Oh man. Oh, I used to work at a grocery store. You've been one of those people that I was like, I'm not judging, just scan and go. They're gonna have yep. their own field stories after that. Oh yeah. <laughs> <laughs> oh, that's so funny. All right. So those are some awesome stories. Um, so I'm sure some of you would have liked someone to tell you some practical advice. Um, so thinking about it now, uh, what is some practical advice that you might not have learned um, in your education or, um, but now that you would give someone kind of starting out in field work um, or, or even your younger, your younger self? self? 
Like maybe Scott would say, Hey, don't offer to help with unlimited, (laughs) with unlimited boundaries. (laughs) You know, what's something that you might even tell yourself if you could some good practical advice street smarts really yeah you don't get it from the textbook that's true right you on the job training mm-hmm. i'll i'll say quickly mine is is fairly short it's you're going to work with people um mm. you know as as scott brought up uh, a couple times now you know i had this idea of a, a field biologist like sam saw sitting on the mountain just you know writing notes down being by myself and all that uh, and i think a lot of people have that impression but People are a part of the system. They're a necessary part of the system at this point, and you've got to talk to people. And it's it's just part of the job nowadays. So get used to it. That's good. That's very that's very practical. I uh, I would suggest that people try to balance enthusiasm and confidence with patience and humility. Dang. Uh, it's a mic drop because I know when I started I thought I knew it all Mm. I still do no (laughs) but but now maybe you know more than I I know that every day is an opportunity to learn something new if Mm. listen we observe if we pay attention to the others around us so I think that's that's it. Learn from other people. Share what you know. Oh, man. I like that's that. a great, that's good advice. It's, could that be like our tagline for Nature Night? Yeah. Like learn from others, share, share what you know. We'll have to ask if we can use that. Yeah. Mm-hmm. Yep. That's great. Thank you so much, Scott. Um, I would always say uh, keep your options open mm. because, you know, going in, you what you start maybe in your college career or whatever you start to think you're going into it might not be where you end up. Mm -hmm. So try different things. Um, Try to figure out what you like. Um, Try to put yourself in a position where you can love your job, because if you do that, that's the most about the most important thing. So. And and what Scott said, also, someone, even if you think you know the best way to do something, try to listen to everybody else's ideas, because they might have a better idea to make things easier in the long run. It's fantastic. Thanks, Ryan. We're social learners. We learn best from people. That's true. You know, so. Sam or Allie, do you guys have anything you'd tell yourself or tell a young Sean or a young Scott starting out? Or something you wish someone told you, I guess. It's hard though, because even when someone tell me something when I'm younger, like you don't own it and learn it until you experience it, but, but you've experienced now. So yeah, Sam, go ahead. I feel like everybody really kind of touched on the main things, but it's, you know, I, I, I guess when I talk to landowners, um, I always try to take time to, to listen to what they already know, Mm. assume I know what to go do. And so I, and also planning in a little bit more time to, to talk with people who, you know, we're all crunched for time and trying to get through things quickly, but you can learn a lot from every single person you encounter if you take the time to talk to them. And I actually even now need to work on that and make sure I do that. I really like it. It's really sage, good yeah. advice. And I, I was expecting people to say like, you know, always pack toilet paper in your truck. Just right. Hey, you, talk like, about, you know, but... that kind of stuff. But this is fantastic. Allie, anything? Yeah, I think mine was along the same lines as Brian's of just trying different things and just try as much as possible, but also like your role models or your mentors. Um, And if you can't find somebody who maybe represents you, then be that person who can represent people like you in the future. Um, So we don't always get to see people like us in in science. And so Mm. we have to be conscious at building that um, diversity of perspectives and, and backgrounds. Um, so don't be, don't be afraid if you're not currently seeing somebody like you in science. That's a really good advice too. Things are changing all the time. Yeah. Who knows what, you know, we probably sure we didn't think of community science 20 years ago, like Mm -hmm. you said, and who knows what 20 years from now will bring us. So very good. I like it. That's good. Got some goosebumps. I know. Yeah. Yeah. 
Okay, so um, our last question of the night for the panelists, and then we have a few lightning round um, questions we'll sneak in at the end, but just wanna hear from every, anyone, because I, I really like this question. And um, it seems like we have an amazing, passionate panel tonight, obviously. Yeah, Everyone we always has, do. Yeah, but absolutely. We're all nerds and we're all passionate yeah. about it, which is pretty cool. Um, so we wanna hear from you, what's been the most satisfying aspect or experience in your career? So it could be like, the best day you had in the field that you can remember, or just overall kind of those, like a conceptual, um, what's, what, what have you been most satisfied with? Think about it for a minute. I'll go first. Go Ryan. Um, I got a couple things. Um, when I was doing my uh, field work for my graduate degree, I, uh, I was able to capture a larval a free embryo larval pallet sturgeon and there'd only been about two or three captured before that so that was kind of a highlight um awesome. other than that you know um just working with an endangered species like we do we kind of seeing you know with like propagation and stuff like that we're seeing how the numbers are increasing a little bit um doing our part to send these fish to the hatchery so they can be propagated uh, and one of the things that I really like about my job is trying to, we talk to a lot of people, like Scott said, we talk to a lot of people at boat ramps, just trying to educate them about mm -hmm. what we do and why we do it. You know, people wonder why we spend so much money on one fish or things like that. Well, it's a really rare fish. And when you find one, you know, like if we follow a fish in reproductive condition, we'll spend a month on that fish. People wow. don't know why we do that. So it's, they're really rare. And the opportunities don't come along all the time. So that's why we do it. And I love to talk to people and tell them even just easy things like identification between shovel nose and pallets so that they don't keep the wrong things and mm -hmm. just try to help out wherever we can. And I think that's kind of makes a guy happy at the end of the day. Yeah, I love that because even though he's a field researcher, part of what is he's most satisfied with, he's talking about education. I'm yeah. just saying, talking to people. Yeah, education's part pretty of cool, mm -hmm. pretty fantastic. Um, who's next? I'll go next. I, I guess as far as, um, being a satisfying aspect of my, my job and career, it's, you know, it, it starts with just feeling like I'm working for a good cause with good people. Mm -hmm. and, and so, the, you know, as I'm spending my time and energy each day that I do that, I'm helping hopefully, uh, our environment and just the, the wildlife that we have here in Nebraska. And then like beyond that, like the result of that is that I've gotten to see, you know, successes that take time to build. So we've, we've eradicated feral pigs from Nebraska. So you don't have to worry about the problems caused by feral pigs. We restored river otters, which were a threatened species. And I did my master's degree working with river otters. And now they're found statewide from border to border in nearly every major river system. And then also with the, the cougar research and just seeing cougars expand and become secure in the Pine Ridge and the Niobrara River Valley and the Wildcat Hills has been really rewarding to see wildlife flourish in our, in our state. Yeah. And to know that we all have a part in it. I think that's, that's one of the coolest things too. That is really cool. And, and seeing part. that long-term too, because I remember early on in my career, jumping from attempt to attempt to attempt position, just bouncing around trying to figure it out. Yeah. But having an opportunity, like he mentioned, to have a position for more than a few months, you know, um, yep. and seeing those long-term gains from it. That's incredible, Sam. Thanks for sharing that. One more. I think uh, probably the satisfying part of, of my career and a lot of the days, days at work are with people with you know when i go from a first time acquaintance with a landowner that wants me to look at something on on his land to <clears throat> not being a biologist anymore but being scott being somebody mm -hmm. that 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 person trusts and that that we've developed a relationship that 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 really becomes a partnership that doesn't involve doesn't involve money it doesn't involve mm -hmm. regulations it doesn't involve any of that it mm -hmm. it it's built on a common interest 
and in a desire to take care of the land. And, and that's, that's the most satisfying part of, of, of what I do, I think, is when, when I can take the time to listen well enough to meet somebody part way and, and develop that, that relationship that might last a lifetime. So. Some good, yeah. some good stuff tonight. Honestly, that's a good way to end, right? That was our last one. Yes. Way to end. I was expecting like lots of hilarious, funny, ridiculous stories. Was. And there were, but it's this beautiful balance of like this wisdom. So pumped about it. Allie or Sean, do you have, um, do you want to answer this question as well? I know it's like a big one, but. Um, you know, I think, um, I, I've had lots of satisfying moments. I'll say that, you know, I've, I've had a lot of really cool things where I've, you know, participated in projects and helped projects get going. And, um, but I think some of the, the most satisfying parts for me, which I never would have said when I, you know, was thinking about being a biologist 10, 20, 30 years ago, um, is, you know, when someone says, you know, thanks, and they're just like, I really appreciate what you did, you know, maybe I just told them what kind of snake it was, or what mm -hmm. kind of, you know, bug that is, or something, but they're just like, thanks, that was, that was really helpful, and, um, and so, I mean, that, that means a lot, um, because, you know, we love doing this anyway, but it, it kind of helps validate that, yeah, you know, it, it does help people, and because the people are the ones that are, you know, caring for the land out there and mm -hmm. uh especially my kids you know my kids one point we were going to school and there was a praying mantis on the side of the school and all the kids started yelling freaking out and my oldest daughter just walked up picked it up and started showing everybody and they immediately quit yelling they all started listening and I was just like perfect and I was like yeah. that's great because then that'll spread from peer to peer much faster mm -hmm. than if I went in and did that and so you know, those kind of things are just really great to see. That's awesome. Yeah, that is cool, especially when it's in your own area yeah. kids. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. I feel like we've seen yeah. that before a lot. As well. And as you mentioned earlier, always carry toilet paper. Yeah, yeah there you go. The practical <laughs> side as well. Yeah. <laughs> Allie, do you have anything? Yeah, I think kind of along the same lines of um, when you're, especially with community science where you're working the the research with the people um mm -hmm. it's kind of two parts so one is that satisfaction or like that understanding that the work you're showing them is like having a change there's a change happening in how mm -hmm. they're viewing their role in mm -hmm. what's happening so like you know banding birds in people's backyards they start asking questions about like wow, how can I support these birds? Like, what um, can I do in my yard, in my space to improve the habitat that that's here? What are some other things that I can do? So you're seeing these connections to stewardship on some level, and it's different with different projects, but um, that translation into stewardship is, is inc it's incredible to me. Like that's, you know, one reason I do what I do. The other thing is getting people to understand that they can participate in science and that it's not this other thing that, yeah. you know, oh, the researchers are doing the science. Oh, the scientists are doing the science. Like um, it's, you know, it sounds a little silly to say, but we can all be scientists. We can all ask these questions. We can take an interest and we can find ways to contribute meaningfully to the work that's being done. And I just think that's, it's beautiful. Like it's just so beautiful. It is, it is. Those are all good things and good to hear and some practical advice. And like you said, just a bunch of passionate yeah. nerds out there. Yes, absolutely. Yeah. Lots of wisdom too. I really, I really appreciate it. I think that was a fantastic last Nebraska Nature Nerd Night. That was for the year. That like I'm sad. One. That was a feel good. Yeah. But this yeah. is like a good feel, feel good one. Mm -hmm. So I appreciate everyone, um, your contributions tonight, your thoughts, your reflections, your funny stories, as well as this amazing uh, wisdom and yeah. And, and the feel good stuff that you've shared tonight. So thank yeah, you guys so absolutely. much. And thank you all the participants tonight too. Thanks for logging on. Um, and thanks to all of you for coming as many times as you did. And if you are looking forward to more nature nerd nights, we will be having some more oh, in yeah, 2022. Sure. We don't know excited. topics yet, but um, got some good ideas. We got so some good ideas on the work. If you have any good ideas, um, we'll be sending out your, the email. This recording will be available. We'll let you know how to see this and share it if you'd like but also make sure you always fill out that evaluation. And if you have any cool, like exciting ideas of topics you want to see us cover, 
next year, please share them with us because we're really looking forward to another year of this. So. Yeah, absolutely. And thank you again, panelists. We really appreciate you guys. Thanks again. Keep rocking it out in the field yes. and, or behind the desk or wherever you yeah. are. Thank you all. Thanks everyone. Have Bye. a good night. Thanks everybody. Thank you. Have thank a great you. time. Thank you.